So last month, I published my 33rd book. Hmm. This one is entitled, The Fictions in Our Convictions, Essays on the Cultural Imagination. So I've <clears throat> inscribed it to you, the congregation, and I'll put it on the bookshelf out here um, after the services for you. And I'm, I really like this book. I mean, I have, 30, <laughs> I have 33 children now, and this one is just, you know, clamoring to be given attention. So I want to do attend to him, her, it this morning. Reading of the exploits and adventures of mythic figures always provokes a sense of wonder in me, as I'm sure it has in you. We enjoy their ventures, the struggles, at times their pettiness, but always something grand about them muscles through. We may find ourselves enchanted by their presences in print or in film, we realize almost intuitively that we should not take these figures too literally, for that move dismantles their mythic structure and with it their presence. Rather, I think of these mythic figures as figures of the imagination, not of logic and not of reason, that we can see by means of, not literally, but by analogy. One of my favorite figures in the Greek pantheon is the goddess Hestia, who, as you may remember, is the daughter of Kronos and Rhea. Now her father, Kronos, and we struggled with Kronos maybe a little bit last night in getting our clocks to move forward, fearing that one of his sons would rise up to defeat him or one of his children, actually, swallowed each of his children when they, were, when they were born. His son, Zeus, would eventually do just that. The firstborn was Hestia, who was devoured first and eventually vomited up last because he finally threw them up. So she represents the archetypal or universal pattern of first and last, of beginnings and endings. As such, she lives within each of us in this pairing, as well as establishes other presences that we become aware of over time. Like other divinities, Hestia is a way of thinking about something a way of imagining qualities like hospitality, being curious, interested in the world of ideas, images, events, transitions, to name just a few. Perhaps her most powerful attribute is as the goddess of concentration, contemplation, and of the ability to focus on something of paying close and sustained attention to what attracts her. She's also the presence of discerning and bequeathing value to this, not that. To what beckons to us, <clears throat> to what feels significant and worth our attention. I think we need her more than ever in this culture of distractions. I would insert here a world distracted and bitten by the bug of entertainment that often keeps us scattered. Now, originally in ancient Greece, Hestia was worshipped at the center of the city. The focus of the polis was the heart of the city. Even the city's hearth, as an analog of the hearth of the individual. The individual's home and the individual's heart. So there's a direct connection between our embodiment and the center of a city. Her counterpart in Roman mythology is Vesta, V-E-S-T-A. <clears throat> so we might ask, 
what is the nature of being at the center such that hearth knowing even becomes possible? Hestia, Hestia, like all the other deities, embodies an attitude, a felt sense of things, as well as a way of knowing them. Her attitude is one of heartfeltness itself. In her presence, one warms to one's subject matter, to situations, and to others with great care and concern. She is as well the energy that warms relationships, giving them heart. When we warm to another of long standing or somebody that is a new found friend, we just have invited Hestia into the relationship, into the heart shared by two or more persons. Now, as Hestia spirals out, she creates or refashions a community, a sense of belonging, of being sheltered, and of having membership in value. Having membership in value. Her presence can gather random events into a common space and into a coherent story, even more important. I think that in some fashion, Hestia is the organizing force of stories themselves, especially those stories that build communal connections between people along the keel of a common purpose or a goal that restores all who participate in it. So she's restorative as an energy of community like the congregation I am currently addressing. Hestia is about you slash us. Both in Greek and Roman iterations of her, Hestia's face is round, captured in the elegant Vestal Temple, some of you may have seen it, resting in the heart of Rome, a site my wife and I visited countless times in the two years that we lived there. Its graceful roundness invited us to walk around to complete the circle. In the Vestal Temple burns a light. Legend has it that if the flame is ever allowed to extinguish, the city will collapse. The flame at her temple echoes the heart of the fire at home. It's where families and friends gather. So Vesta Hestia relates polis to the home's hearth. And one more step to the individual's hearts that live there. More universally, perhaps, at night, at a campsite, the central gathering is often around the flames and the burning embers of the fire. There, each person can see all the others because most often, everyone together adds to the circle. The night is held back by the light of the fire. And often, this setting evokes stories to be shared among those gathered. Gather a group of people around a campfire and stories are going to start popping up almost instinctively. So to sit in the round or even to cultivate well-roundedness is to enter Hestia's rich geometry, both personal and if extended out, planetary. I sense that Hestia is also complicit in the acts of reading and writing, meditating and praying. Early each morning, around 4, 4.15, I enter my study with a hot cup of coffee. My first ritual following making that cup of brew is to light a candle on a small altar 
across from the easy chair that I sit and read and write in. There in the flame of the candle and my small reading light, I've just got a small gooseneck light because I want just a little pocket of light in the darkness of the room and the darkness of outside. I enter Hestian space. There to meditate on what is cur currently calling me to entertain it, to ponder in a contemplative mode of consciousness. I believe that Hestia is the energy of contemplation itself. I always sense a virginal quality to this time and place of the day, unpolluted yet by the cares and responsibilities that daylight will bring. As a synthesizer, Hestia's flame illuminates virginal ideas, even a purity of presence that original thinking inaugurates and sustains for a period of time. It can't be sustained for lengthier times. At least I can't. I remember when in teaching at a graduate institute in Santa Barbara, uh, the one that was mentioned by Sarah, that I asked the students if we could begin sitting in a circle so that each could see one another. And because there weren't desks, there were, there were very comfortable chairs, it was a whole lot easier to change the uh, geometry. Studying in the round made a palpable difference. Students no longer looked at or around the back of their classmates' heads. Moreover, I sat with them each time, rather than standing behind the podium. Now, the podium, I can't get off on it, but the podium is an invention of Hermes. The podium is where one goes to have the attention in which to speak. But we're in Hestian space, so we sit in the round. I add here another quality of Hestia that reveals her as instrumental to the origin of myth itself, I think. If you'll entertain that a myth is akin to a via or a way, an avenue or a corridor, all of which promote focusing. When you can get, you know, tunnel vision takes a bad rap. I think there's a virtue in tunneling tunneling your vision so you can focus. Now, you don't want to stay in there. I think it'll breed a neurosis and maybe get you arrested. But there are times when maybe focusing in on a tunnel way is beneficial. A myth can also include a particular style of understanding, of ascribing value to something to make it more vibrantly present. What allows me, and I suggest you, to focus on anything or anyone is the myth that I am in and perceiving by. See, so I'm just, I'm just pushing a little bit how myths are not content. They're, they're, av they're ways to think about things. Our personal myth is like one's home from which we perceive, imagine, and value the world, but in a relational way, not in a way that, is, that prom promotes a discrete, independent person. When we sharpen or otherwise attend to what, makes, what matters to focus on, that's a form of remythologizing our lives infusing them with a clear purpose and a vision, but always open to revision. So as you have occasions and circumstances where you are compelled or nudged to refocus what you're doing in and with your life, what matters most to you in your relationships with others, and what's no longer serving you in your sense of destiny and purpose, know that you have entered Hestian space. She is the imaginal presence that aids us in repatterning 
or repurposing our lives as a form of imagining ourselves anew. In another venue, rewriting, revising, renewing, revisioning our Hestian behaviors. In rewriting, for example, one's focus sharpens. And you all know that from when you revise something to get it closer to the truth. Fire, light, illumination can clarify. They can also reveal boundaries and borders. Or makes an image that guides you in a more focused and new, <coughs> nuanced way. Rereading, for example, is also Hestian. In re-engaging a text or any piece of writing, and you've had the experience a million times, we notice details, connections, and associations that the first or second reading hid or just glossed over. Rereading or any re-word puts us in a place that is at once both familiar and new. Hestia is the host that allows ideas, both perceived and imagined, a safe place to be reconsidered when they are under review. Courtesy is part of her presence as well. It's an interesting word, courtesy. It comes from the French queer, and I'm butchering it, I know, which means of the heart or heartfelt. Courteous acts like listening, speaking without attacking or colonizing the other's understanding, evoke the presence of Hestia. In authentic conversation, we adjust and adapt to others' thoughts, insights, and points of view from a Hestian place of openness. Not agreement, but perhaps a certain consensus is the offspring of Hestian conversations. Hospitality is an opulent form of big hearth edness. It requires a large heart or even great souledness to listen with authentic attention to another without violating that space with one's overriding opinion. Warming to another's ideas is not a synonym for surrendering to them or to pretend one agrees. Rather, it is to allow the fire of their own perspective to infiltrate and perhaps modulate our own stance. Allowing such is a grandly hospitable endeavor allowing one to dwell with contrary points of view in apposition, not opposition. Change one letter and you, you have a, a, a sense of uh, acceptance and a, a sense of uh, conflict. One letter. Hestia relegates a sense of the sacred then in human interactions. And as I finish, two points. Hestia is an archetype of the imaginal realm who bestows on her own imagination a civility, a courtesy, and a continuity. Three C's. Because her gifts of focusing and hospitality. Without her, learning and human relationships would be flat, more self-absorbed, static, and inviting further strife. Remember, though, that she's most valuable when she's invited in. You want to be open so she can be, come in and be present. When she shows up, this has been my experience, prepare to be a proper host so she can guest herself into your soul, there to kindle a fire that might have been extinguished without our being aware of it. Her presence will spark gratitude in anyone who chooses to notice her benevolent presence. And I want to thank you all 
for your hestian attention to this talk. Yeah.